right, I am excited about the word today. I believe that God has something for us, and I want to turn your attention to the book of John, John 2. John 2, 13 through 23, and this is our lectionary passage uh, for this Sunday. We are in the season of Lent. It's not too late to get in on the Lent bus if you want to give up something for Lent. Something. It don't got to be, you know, like we did meat and sweets. I know that was a lot for all of some people. But if you just want to give up, um, I had a friend that said, I'm getting up, giving up being resentful. I was like, well, okay, yes. I'm here. I'm here for it. So the, we are still in the, the season of Lent until Easter. I hope y'all paying attention to the announcements. Don't come here at 10 on Easter. I'm just going to tell you. Don't come at 10. What time are you supposed to come? You got two ch- all right, I'm going to see. I'm going to see. I'm going to be out with a check. I'm going to see who was paying attention when you roll up at 10. Now, now, I believe in y'all. I believe in you. I believe in you. 9 and 11. All right. The word of the Lord reads, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of money uh, changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Verse 18, then the haters, I mean the Jews, said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up, period. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered, somebody say remember, that he had said these things and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Amen. What a powerful scripture. Our subject today is cleansing power. Cleansing power. Let y'all get a little snapshot of this. Cleansing power. God will bring your word, send your anointing. God, open the ears of your people to hearts that they will receive what you would want to say to us today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. Amen. Well, a few times when I've spoken, I've, I've spoken about a movie, and I know you guys are probably tired of me talking about this movie, but it's a movie that cracks me up every time. And every time is one particular line that gets me every time. The movie is Talladega Nights. How many people have seen Talladega Nights? I don't recommend the movie, so don't say like my pastor told me to watch it. I'm just saying if you had seen it, raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, good, good. Okay, then y'all know if you haven't seen it, I'll fill you in. There's a part where uh, Will Ferrell <laughs> is praying at the, at the table for over dinner. And, um, and, and, and in, this, in, this, what, in this prayer, he wants to pray a particular way. And he always addresses the prayer as, dear Lord, baby Jesus, right? And then he goes on to say, dear eight pounds, six ounce, newborn, infant Jesus, don't even know a word yet, just a little infant, so cuddly, but still omnipotent. His wife is like, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't have to call him that. It's a little odd and off-putting, like, to pray to a baby. And Ricky Bobby said, well, look, I like Christmas Jesus the best when I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want, right? And then he, you know, he goes on to continue to pray to little baby Jesus. Uh, it cracks me up every time. I don't care. I will laugh hysterically. The point is that people love baby Jesus. That's me. I'm sorry. I was spying on the people online, and then I, I'm hearing myself talk. 
There it is. This is quite unprofessional. I'm sorry. The point is about Ricky Bobby is that people like baby Jesus. They like little well-behaved, contained Jesus. Jesus that goes with the status flow. Jesus so lowly, meek, and mild. People love little baby Jesus, and not too many people want to deal with spicy Jesus. They don't want to deal with Jesus out of control. Jesus on a rampage. They don't want to, you know, they don't want Jesus to do too much. Not too much, Jesus, right? Now, a lot of people, I don't know if you've seen or heard this story, maybe in Sunday school or vacation Bible school, about um, this incident that Jesus was a part of. A lot of people say, like, this is angry Jesus. Angry Jesus was mad. You know, and most people are like, yeah, this is my time of Jesus, yeah. Now, this is the Jesus I could get with. Revolutionary Jesus, right? Coming through, knocking stuff over, shutting it down. Uh, I can... uh, So now you're saying, because of this Jesus, I could be mad too, and I could just go off on whoever I want to bet, right? This is the Jesus we want to identify with. But if we look carefully at the text, and uh, again, I don't know if you could put up the first scripture slide. Um, If we look carefully at the text, I want you to see where in this text does it actually say that Jesus was angry? Do you see the word angry anywhere? Do you see the word mad anywhere? Do you see, I mean, we kind of, you know, assume he was angry. Um, you know, he, he, by his actions, you know, he had like, you know, angry tendencies, we would say. But I would like to offer uh, that Jesus wasn't um, necessarily mad or angry for anger's sake. I don't think like that was the root of his actions. The root of his actions wasn't that he was just, you know, peed off that day, right? Um, He was actually cleansing the temple, as he should. Now, everybody don't like a good cleansing, amen? I I could tell, but, you know, spring is coming up. I think uh, it's coming up soon. And then there's those who really enjoy spring cleaning, and you're going to clean everything, baseboards, everything, everything, every corner, every crevice, And then there's other of us that just want to straighten up a little bit. You ever had somebody just try to come to your house and do a full cleanse? You're like, hey, don't throw that out. I need that. Who told you to touch that? But some of us, we just want to straighten up, just put stuff together. And that kind of goes with our lives, too. We don't need a little, we don't need all the things cleanse. We just need it to just be a little presentable, right? But obviously, in this story, Jesus felt some type of way, right? Am I, we're not making that up. There's no way you could just overturn tables and be like, uh, you know, like, I'm mad. Like, you have to have some, it was some, some vigor behind it, right? Um, he felt some type of way, but I want to submit to you that it wasn't anger. But instead, as the scripture pointed out, it was zeal. Zeal or jealous devotion. Now, zeal, the definition, is dedication or enthusiasm, I'm sorry, enthusiasm for something. If you have zeal, you are willing, energized, motivated. Zeal, in a Christian perspective, is a burning desire to please God, to do his will, to advance his glory in the world in every way possible. I want to submit to you that Jesus wasn't necessarily mad, but he was acting in passion, in zeal, in a mighty devotion. Jesus, as the young folks would say, was actually standing on business. In the context of this whole incident, we see that it was the Passover, which was one of the biggest um, festival days of the Jewish calendar. It was the day when they would commemorate when God rescued the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And that's when Jesus went into Jerusalem for the celebration. Now, the people were required to make a sacrificial offering. Y'all tracking with me? And since many of the pilgrims came from great distances, they couldn't always bring their own animals. So they like, that's okay. We got you. We'll, you know, you could buy your animals at the, at the temple. 
which meant that the animal merchants had a flourishing business in the temple yard. All right, seems cool so far. Then there were money changers who were there because the temple tax was to be paid only in local currency. So foreigners had to have their money changed. Like when you go out of the country, anybody go to the, you got to get the, the money for wherever you are, right? They had to change the money, and the money changers often charged an exorbitant ex exchange amount. They were basically loan sharks. So it sounds a little bit like a flea market. I don't understand. Why, 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 why the big deal? You know, everybody out there meeting, greeting, hustling. You know, they getting their money on. They doing all these things. So what made Jesus start wowing? Why did he start wowing? Why did he start driving them out? Why did he start knocking over tables? Why did he start pouring out money? I almost started to do all that. I had a whole big thing of change, and I was going to put it all and throw it everywhere. And then I didn't feel like cleaning it up. So I didn't do that. So just imagine in your mind. All these things that Jesus did. Jesus really made a scene. But I want to add in there that no animals or humans were hurt in this incident. <laughs> Read the text. He didn't hit nobody. He just, y'all got to get to moving. But why was he so passionate? I got three reasons. Take notes if you want to take notes. Jesus hated when people set up obstacles that kept people from God. He hated it. Ask him when they tried to bring the children to Jesus. Jesus, here come my little Ray Ray and them. And they're like, hey, hey, he busy. He's like, uh, 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 let him come to me. He was always mad when the Pharisees would put all these rules and laws and all these things you had to do to do and not to do that kept people from God. He's like, hey, y'all cut that out. You setting up barriers for people to come to me. He hated this. The real problem was that the market was set up in the court of the Gentiles. So in there, you had a place for the Jews and you had a place for the Gentiles. This was the only space that outsiders were allowed to enter. They were not able to engage with God in the outer courts. If they weren't able to engage with God, then how would they have a chance to even hear or get close to God? And this is what set Jesus off. Y'all going to go where the foreigners are? Y'all going to go to the people who don't really even know about me, the people who want to learn about me, and that's where you're going to charge people a lot of money? You're not going to go to the, your own people, the Jews. You're going to take advantage of those who are coming from afar off, those who may not even be of this faith but want to know more about Jesus. I mean, want to know more about God in this context. He was mad about that. Don't do that to the foreigner. Don't do that to the immigrant. Don't do that to the ones who don't really know about me, and this is their only chance to hear about me. Does that sound familiar? This whole, uh, in, in, our, in our everyday lives, of how we keep people away from God, people who need to come closer to God, people who may not follow the law or religion like you, but we put up all these barriers no, you got to dress like this. You got to act like that. You got to sit like this. You have to love like this. You have to be a, have that person. You have to have not have that person. We set up all these barriers. Jesus was angry with the religious establishment, a.k.a. the Sadducees, Pharisees, the primary teachers of the law, and his own disciples all for the same reason. They were keeping vulnerable people away from God warning they were all religious people just like you and me if you ever peruse through the gospels rarely will you find that jesus was mad at a sinner i won't even say rarely i, I don't even know of an incident when jesus was angry or mad or upset with someone who they felt like you know he hung out with prostitutes he was hanging out with tax collectors he was hanging out with the the least of these who was he always peed off with? The disciples, the law, the, the Pharisees, the rulers, the people who had at the... Those who should know better. Those who really say that they know God. He was always... I mean, he was on their head. He was talking to, uh, to them all the time. Like, what are y'all doing? 
right? Okay, so that was his first reason why Jesus went wild. And second reason, I believe that Jesus was outraged that the temple had become a marketplace. We hear that a lot. I remember, like, you couldn't sell, like, raffle tickets and all that growing up in church. You couldn't do chicken dinners or you couldn't, nothing for sale at church, all because of this particular. But I would like to say that I think that is in a different context of what Jesus was saying. Uh, The temple tax had to be paid, like I told you, in local currency. So foreigners had to uh, change their money, and the money changers charged these, these, uh, inflated prices and the people were required to make a sacrificial offering and so since they couldn't do that they would come and they would provide the animals and they say even the tradition says it would be like these ugly looking lame looking animals like when you were supposed to give an offering you're supposed to give God your best you're supposed to raise the little offering you're supposed to give the little lamb and you raised it and you was like I'm gonna give it to God you know so they were had these little sickly looking things and they would charge people crazy amounts of money. So it wasn't that they were just selling. It actually started off as a good idea, a matter of convenience. And then someone, as capitalism goes, was like, hey, we could actually make a killing out here. And this is the thing that Jesus was mad at. For us uh, business owners, when you get into positions of power and you get into uh, money or you come into a place where you have an idea, please keep these principles in mind that we're not always supposed to take advantage of people and always chasing a dollar and always seeing how I could blow up and how I could get the bag and how I could, you know, I could go to scamming a little bit because, you know, who would know? I could do a little over here and then go cash it over here and then put it over here and nobody would even know. Keep these principles in mind when it comes to how are we handling those who don't have that much? Are we giving more or are we trying to get more money from them? Right? These are principles. It's in the Bible. I'm not sure where we missed it. I don't think nobody reading the Bible, but that's just me. Third thing, why was Jesus wilding? The dove and the pigeons that he threw, he's like, get them out of here. That dove and pigeon offering, that was reserved for the poor. See, everybody couldn't afford to bring a lamb or a goat or a cow. And God made provisions about that. You can check that out in the Old Testament. He's like, okay, if you don't have that much money, just bring a a pigeon or a dove, and that will suffice for your offering. It was reserved for the poorest of Israel to bring a dirt, a, a turtle dove or a pigeon. And fun fact, we know this um, about Jesus' upbringing because when he was a baby and was presented at the temple, Mary and Joseph gave a dove, dove or pigeons for that offering when Jesus was an infant, leading us to believe that they didn't have a lot of money, y'all. They was just... Just looking out of the window. They were they was just trying to make it. Right? <laughs> oh, come on. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> so if people couldn't afford all these things, and now you gonna sell outlandish prices to the poorest of the poor at inflated rates to people who are captive audiences. Just like the same bottle of water at the grocery store, and if you go to the amusement park, it's a different price. If you go to the airport, it's a different price. Same bottle, same water. I don't know how I got up to $8, $9 at the movies all the time. Because we are a captive audience. And so they knew when these poor people were coming to the temple with all that they had, this all I could I, I could have, all I could afford is a dove, or and they're like, all right, that'll be a hundred dollars. You know, just something. And they were capitalizing on the poor. This is why we got to read the scriptures, or you will believe everybody on IG who's telling you that the Bible don't care about poor people, or Christianity is not for the poor, or all these things. And no, it's actually in here. This is what set Jesus off. Take advantage, taking advantage of already poor people. We see this all the times in our world today. Can y'all just start naming out some places where we see these practices? Just yell it out. What, what just, 
food desert, taxes, come on, housing, ooh, I, what is it? Utilities, gross, groceries right now, boy. Boy, let me tell you about back in my day, I could take $20 and do a whole week of groceries. Woo! My son, wait, did, did we not? Tommy, no. Well, we used to go come up with $20. I'll leave with two items right now for $20. Maybe. Where else are we seeing exploitative practices? Education. Prison system. Health care. Yeah, ooh, cash bail. See, we just named in a matter of seconds all the places. We didn't even exhaust the list of how people are taking advantage. People are taking advantage of the people who are already down. People already don't got enough. We didn't even talk about the little uh, money, uh, where you go to the little store to get your quick check cashing. Woo! Check cashing place. ATM fee, can, why I can't get my own money? Just because it ain't with your little place. You saw my account, you know I ain't got it. Just give it, get my money. Right? So this is what we're, we see it all the time. We see it all the time. And then we wonder, like, um, does, does Jesus even care? You know? We were wondering, like, what's going on? Like, why is nothing happening? So how did Jesus handle it? How did he handle it? I love this about Jesus because Jesus disrupted it. I love it. He just came through there slanging things. He drove them out. Get out. Get. Go on. He overturned things. Can you imagine him just pouring out money in front of people like, yeah, uh-huh, go on. Like, Oh, I wish I had cameras back there. I would love to have seen this. Like, he really, well, he, he really made a mess. The reason why I didn't want to do the, the demonstration, because I didn't feel like cleaning up a bunch of quarters, right? Oh, thank you. I know. See, yes. Yeah, see, I knew it in the States. I was going to be like, put my, put my laundry quarters back. <laughs> I knew I was going to see. I didn't want to have to tackle the saints on this day. So... I love that even in the text it said that uh, he made a whip of cords. This is so interesting. He had the Daz band anointing. Some of y'all will get this later. Y'all get it later. <laughs> I love this because it said he made this whip. Now this is what this is what I really uh huh. Look, she just got it. She just got it. You'll get it later. Oh, look, they, oh, <laughs> the dad's band anointed. Um, for some of y'all who are not old enough, it's the Let It Whip song. So, all right, I gave it away. Um, but I love that when he made this whip, check this out. He didn't, like, summon his 12 disciples and be like, hey, everybody make a whip right now. Here, I got a whip for you, a whip for you, a whip for you. Let's go. Spread four corners. Everybody get everybody. Right? He wasn't handing out whips. He didn't ask his disciples to join in on the whipping. He didn't bring his crew in, and we're going to turn everything on, turn everything over. Why? Because this was his work to do. This was his work to do. This cleansing of the temple, that work belonged to him. That, see, a lot of times we put our place in a narrative in the wrong place. We want to be like, when we see things about Jesus, we, you even ever notice about this in Scripture, you never really side with the sinner. Like, we don't ever see ourselves as the people selling the things. We'd be like, yeah, I'm on Jesus' side, and I'm going to do everything Jesus did. Well, everything's not for us to do. This work belonged to Jesus. It was his job to drive them out. It was his job to overturn the tables. It was his job to, to you know, wreak havoc. It was his work to do. We got to get this because we think that it's our job. I'm supposed to be the beacon for justice, in which we are in some sense. I'm supposed to be the one 
be the one. I'm just going to fill in the blank. I'm supposed to be the one. We think that when we take on the whole weight of everything we just named out, all these exploitative exploitative practices, and we take on the weight of them, we carry them, we get depressed about them, we're sad about them, we're in this whole cycle of I don't know what to do, I feel helpless, all these things are going on. We didn't even touch Palestine and what's going on there and how exploitative that is and how gruesome and how horrible and how evil it is, and we take it on and we internalize it, and we have to realize that this work is for Jesus to do. So then what are we supposed to do? Are we just supposed to sit around, watch it happen, be innocent bystanders? Is that our role? You know, that's the role the church is typically played sometimes. Well, we're just going to pray about it and just. So where is the balance? If we're not the one doing it, where do we fit into this? Well, I'm glad you asked. I believe... Jesus told us the key. This is why Jesus pointed them back to the original purpose of the temple. He said, this is a house of prayer. This temple is a house of prayer. This temple was supposed to be the place where people can connect with God. This temple was the one place where they can find God. This temple was the one place where they could communicate with God. This place is is the house of prayer. And so that's what it symbolizes. And so in this temple is where we pray for Jesus to do it again. This is the place where we come together in community and say, Jesus, do it again. Turn it over again. Disrupt the systems again. Turn over the tables again. Do it again, Jesus. The work that you do, that thing that only you can do, kick out the money changers. God, do it. Do it in our community. Do it in our homes. Do it in our houses. Do it in our neighborhood. Kick them out. Drive them out. Get your little whip. Do the thing. That's where we come in. We come into the temple, into the house of prayer to ask Jesus to do it again. Do it again. Do your job. Your job is to cleanse the temple. That's not my job. That's your job. Do it again. Somebody say, do it again. That's why we are emphasizing prayer every week. We are emphasizing community prayer. Yes, we should have times that we pray alone, but there are times where we need to come together as a corporate body and pray. We have a, a, our lead pastor is someone who is out doing the things. And typically we like, go on, Pastor Mike, you better go ahead. Pastor Mike in Washington, D.C. Go, go, Pastor Mike. He got on board. We just cheering him on. But this is our way of how we can undergird the movement. We have to come together to pray. I heard a quote that says, Sunday morning service shows how popular your church is. Sunday evening services, when we used to have them, uh, show how popular your pastor is. But prayer meeting shows you how popular God is. That's where we find the power. So this is just a little commercial plug. Wherever you are, we offer prayer both on Zoom and in person, 6 o'clock on Tuesdays. Please be here. We are going to try to really pray through our DNA, pray through belonging, pray through justice and and de-churchifying and and Jesus. We would love for you to be here. We're going to really lift up our pastor in this work, especially in this voting season, right? He on the front lines, and we got to hold him up. Amen? Amen. So... The cleansing power of a disruptive Jesus. That's what, if you don't walk away with nothing else today, I want you to walk away with the cleansing power of a disrupted Jesus. Let us not be surprised when things are in turmoil, when stuff gets messy. Perhaps Jesus is cleansing. Yeah, you reading the you reading the newspaper every day. You like things are getting bad. I can't believe you feel anybody feel overwhelmed by news, especially if you're on social media. It's like, Lord, if they do one more breaking news, I don't I don't even have the capacity, right? Perhaps 
Jesus is cleansing. And it's not just about a church building, but what about our lives? Right? What about our lives? We often sing songs we don't mean. Wash me, Lord. Purify my heart. We sing, oh, we be, yes, Jesus. We sing all these songs like, just make me new. Cleanse me. Send the rain, Jesus. You know, we, well, we be into it too deep. But, you know, this is what I just want to be clear when you're asking Jesus to cleanse. What you going to do when this Jesus show up in your life? Because this is Jesus' definition of cleansing. Oh, y'all thought he was just going to come in here with a cute little cloth like, hey, guys, excuse me, excuse me, don't want to get out your way. You're okay. No. You are, then I think this is why we need to really um, prep people on their prayers. Like, we like, come on, lift your hands and surrender. Okay, do you know what that means when you say it and you go to surrender? Do you really know what you mean when you're saying God cleanse me? Because he going to show up in your life, knocking stuff over, making a mess, turning over tables, driving out stuff that ain't supposed to be. Here's a new revelation. Maybe this is what cleansing looks like, an upheaval. You ever have an internal upheaval? You ever have a mental upheaval when things are getting taken away from you or people are walking away from you? Like, wait a minute, I ain't even did nothing to you. I've been nothing but good. Why, what? Maybe Jesus is cleansing. When you say, Lord, take away everything that's not like you, oh God. You inviting cleansing Jesus in. You want this Mr. Clean to come on? He coming. And and I want you to know that doesn't mean like, I ain't never praying that again. I don't want you to walk away with that. Please don't be like, I'm never going to pray again. Thanks to that pastor. It's a beautiful work. What Jesus did. It was needed. People was doing too much. And so there's some people in your lives doing too much. There's some people taking advantage of your love, taking advantage of your gifts. Some people love to make money off of what you do. Want to be the manager of your life. Emotions, feelings, thoughts, taking advantage of you. This is what it looks like when Jesus, it's a beautiful work. Because when he get done, baby, it's going to be clean. Right? And not just the building. I love the verse that says, what? Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? In which uh, you belong to God and you're not your own? Come on, pat yourself on the chest and be like, I'm the temple. I'm the temple. Wait a minute. After Jesus rose from the dead... And we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Yes, we meet here, but baby, you the church now. Jesus lives in you. So why don't we let Jesus do a deep cleanse? How many of you been on a cleanse? Did y'all do a cleanse this, this year? I know I need to get on a little juice cleanse or something. But we want to do a, a juice cleanse, but perhaps God is inviting us into a spiritual cleanse. And why? Why does Jesus want to do this? Why? Remember, he said, zeal for your house has consumed me. Do you know that Jesus has those same feelings about you as the temple? He's jealous over you. He's zealous over you. He's jealously devoted to you. Jesus don't want nothing standing in the way between you and him and your communication with God. He will go through these limps. To move everything that's not supposed to be there. Remember Jesus said, I mean, for God said, even in the Old Testament, you should worship no other gods. For the Lord, who's, your Lord, your God is jealous. He's a jealous God. God is a jealous God. Not like crazy jealous, like your toxic relationship. Not that. <laughs> not that. But jealous, passionate. Like, I want you. I pay for you. I heard that yesterday. Why God can't get what God paid for? Why he can't get what he paid for? 
right? This is what God is doing in our lives. He wants to remove everything that's standing in your way of communication, of your prayer life. What's keeping you from having a contact with God? What is in the way? So I want to invite us to our reflection questions, if y'all could put up the reflection questions. Then we're going to do a closing prayer, and then we're going to end in communion. Our reflection questions are, if you compare your spiritual life to the rooms in a house, which room do you think Jesus might want to clean up? The TV room where you binge watch shows? The dining room, which could represents your appetite or desires, the workshop where you keep your skills, the bedroom where intimate matters reside, family room where your relationships are lived out, or a closet where your hang-ups are. Can everyone stand? We're just going to do some closing prayer. Let's just take a moment to invite a cleansing God into our lives. And like I said, Jesus does everything with love and with purpose. I want somebody who's going to fight for me. I'm going to fight for what's right. You ain't going to do my person any old kind of way, Right? What love that our Savior has for us that won't allow people to take advantage of our hearts and our minds and our souls. Even if we are facing all these practices externally, God wants to free us and cleanse us internally. So God, as a community, we stand and we say, Jesus, do it again. Come on, can you say it? Say, Jesus, do it again. Do it again, Jesus. Our world needs you. Start in this temple, me. Do it again. God, do it in our church. Do it again in our communities. God, we need you. All the things we called out are from our houseless loved ones to rents and housing and groceries. God, we need you to do it again. God, we're praying for our nation. Do it again, God. Turn over tables. Drive them out, God. Everything that's not like you, oh God, cleanse it over our government, oh God. Do it again. Disrupt. Turn over the tables. Cause an upheaval, God. Do it again. God, for Palestine, God, do it again. Have mercy, God, and all over the world where there's injustice. God, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Come on, will you just have say a personal prayer over your life? Say, Jesus, I don't, yeah, I, I, I need a cleansing. Now, I don't know what that looks like because it looked like you do a really thorough job. But God, give me a heart to yield to your cleansing. I give you permission to turn over everything that's not like you. Come on, will you be brave enough to pray that prayer? God, will you disrupt the things that are keeping me from you? Will you disrupt and drive out things that are keeping me from praying to you and communicating with you? And when you take these tendencies, these capitalistic tendencies that we've been formed in, can you change our hearts so that we would look out for the marginalized, that we would look out for the exploited, that we will uh, take care of those who don't have enough. You created this world so that everyone can have enough. So God, let us lean into what you want to do. God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.